Hi and welcome to a 3D4 tutorial. In this video we learn how to export lens distortion data from 3D4 to Nuke and how to handle it within this compositing tool. Since there are various ways to do that, we structure this demo in three chapters, each focusing on a different method. These three chapters are Grid Warp, the Lens Distortion Plugin Kit, short LDPK, and ST Maps. If you like to watch only a single method, feel free to skip to it. Each chapter works individually. At the end of this video, we sum up everything with pros and cons of each method. Well, there's still a lot to show. Let's get started. Of course, we need a soft shot for exporting data. For this purpose, we use a shot with lens breathing filled with an anamorphic lens. Yes, we're using the serious stuff. How to solve this shot is demonstrated in detail in tutorial Adjust Curve Vertices, which can be found on 3 d Force website and YouTube channel. The link to it is also within the description. So, a quick recap. When playing the footage we notice lens breathing effects due to the anamorphic lens. This was solved with the lens with dynamic distortion, driven by focus distance. With option Undistort activated, we see the result. Especially parameters lens rotation and both squeeze have a huge impact on image deformations. Okay, back to our topic, exporting data. The first method shown is exporting with grid warp. As the name indicates, it creates a grid covering the footage and warps this grid throughout the scene according to lens distortion parameters to undistort sad footage. We will see this grid very clearly a step later within Nuke. Okay, let's go to Menu, 3D4, File, Export. Here we can find Export Script, Export Distortion to New Grid Warp. When selecting this entry, a requester pops up. What to do here? At first, let's define name and path of the exported file. Next, Resolution is already set correctly, since it reads the footage resolution automatically from the project. Parameter Grid Warp Resolution defines the amount of control vertices of the grid. There is no need to modify this in at least 99% of all cases. However, in shots with extreme distortion like fisheye, increasing this value might be helpful, but at the cost of performance. Start frame might be an issue of your concern, since you handles frame numbers differently than 3D4. Let me explain. In our case, file sequence head focus starts with index number 0, and the first frame in 3D4 and many other 3D software is 1, a natural and intuitive start of a sequence. However, in Nuke, the sequence will start with frame number 0, the first index number of our files. Now, since Grid Warps animates the grid for undistorting with keyframes, leaving this parameter at default would result in a shifted grid warm animation of exactly one frame. In practice, to avoid this error, it is common to match values of first frame and start frame number. To demonstrate clearly what will happen in Nuke if both do not match, we'll mess things up and change parameter start frame to 1001. Back to the exporter. We see Parameter start frame here was set accordingly. Overscan will be considered later in this video, so don't mind leave it this way for now. Alright, everything's set up. Time to take action and click OK. Perfect, bye bye 3D4. We're moving on to Nuke. Well, for now. Let's import our little node by right-clicking in the node graph, then selecting File, Insert Comp Notes. Navigate to the folder previously chosen and OK. Connect the viewer's pipe to Grid Warp node. Double-click on the new node and here we go. As promised, we see the grid and its deformations. Of course, currently it doesn't match with the project's default to K resolution. Let's fix this now. Import footage, head focus from 3D4's tutorial folder. 
In case you don't have it already, all tutorial footage data can be downloaded from section download on 3dequalizer.com. Ok, connect pipe source with the imported footage. Now everything's fitting perfectly. Everything, except that the image seems to be a bit squashed. Pixel aspect is set to a false value. In parameter format of the read node, beside all the default formats, we can find an existing and already selected entry with the resolution of our footage. Let's edit this format. In the upcoming requester, change pixel aspect to 1.5. Please note, this is a quite untypical compression ratio resulting from the lens used to film this footage. Let's give this format a name. Ok, and we see, now really everything's correct. When clicking through the sequence, we see no one distortion. Remember, we set frame 1001 as start frame for grid warp, as seen in Dope Sheet. So, image sequence and grid warp are not really fitting. How can we fix this? One approach would be exporting grid warp again with start frame 0, but we'd like to do this here in Nuke. In Read Node, simply set parameter frame to start at then enter 1001. Here we go, both footage and grip warp are matching. We're almost done. Last step is setting the timeline to the new frame range since it is still set to 0 to 243. Change option frame slider range from global to input. Good. Now when clicking through the sequence, it can be seen perfectly how the grid warps to achieve an undistorted image. Great so far, but this now leads to a minor problem, which can become a major one. The keyword here is overscan. But where exactly is the problem? In order to correct lens breathing effects, grid warp has to scale with and hate or squeeze the image in X and Y direction. In our case, the image gets wider and taller as seen quite good by the grid. If we export this footage, we will lose all data outside the footage's visible area. The image will be cropped. Seems not a big deal at the moment, but later down the pipeline, after all CGI and corrections and whatever was added, lens distortion has to be applied again for getting back the original look of the lens. Remember, to undistort our footage, it gets wider and taller. Now to distort it again, it has to be squeezed along X and Y again, but this time in inverse direction. Not hard to see what will happen. Right, we will get black areas at all edges due to the previous cropping. A potential catastrophe. For avoiding this, we have to create something like a buffer zone around the footage. Basically, we have to expand the canvas around it, so it can squeeze as much as it needs. That's overscan. For this purpose, node grid warp must be exported a second time. So back to 3D4. As previously, select export distortion to new grid warp. Now activate toggle button overscan. Parameter overscan resolution becomes editable, but which resolution is correct? A little script inside 3D4 helps determining the maximum resolution resulting from squeezing. In distortion grid controls, let's select Calc, Compute Bounding Box for Dynamic Lens Distortion. Please note before running the script, make sure the current camera is selected in Object Browser, otherwise it won't work. In the appearing Python console, the result is printed. So we could copy and use these values since they are precise. But it is more common to have a default resolution for footage with overscan within the production pipeline. So we stick with this way. Just in case you don't want the footage bigger as needed, this script is quite helpful. Back to Grid Warp Exporter. Our imaginary pipeline designers sent us a memo that they have defined a default overscan resolution of 2200 by 1200 pixels, roughly 10% higher than the footage. Such great guys. Last, enter a new file name and two times. OK. Back to Nuke. 
import new comp node grid warp like we've done it before. This one looks a bit different. There is a reformat node automatically generated and connected to grid warp. Let's see what it does. First, connect the viewer to grid warp node. Then reformat pipe to the footage. As we can see, there's indeed a black area around the footage and all the formations can be entirely seen, just like in 3D E4. Node reformat automatically created a new, bigger format and placed the footage unscaled and centered inside. When clicking through the sequence, we notice that the images never leave the outer container. Perfect! This sequence could be exported now without any concerns. Well, we correctly undistorted footage for working in Nuke. Let's play compositing artist and add stunning CGI to our footage. An amazing checkerboard. Merge it with the original sequence. We see we need some adjustments. First, the checkerboard's resolution should match with the overscan format to provide enough content for potential transformations caused by redistorting in later steps. Second, blending method or operation should be something like overlay, so both images can be seen. Click through the sequence and here we go, two undistorted plates composited together. As promised, stunning. Why did we do this? The checkerboards helps us in the next step, redistorting the footage. Let's copy node grid warp and insert it after node merge. This node always undistorts by default, so in this case we undistorted footage twice resulting in this strange look. To fix this, double click on node grid warp and change parameter output to destination warped. All distortion data will be applied reverse resulting in a distorted image. But wait, where's the image? Since we defined destination as output, the correct pipe has to be connected as well. So disconnect pipe source and connect destination. Perfect. Go through the sequence to see lens distortion was applied correctly. We have done a great job. That's it with grid warp. We learned how to export distortion data from 3D4 correctly with overscan and how to undistort and redistort footage in Nuke. Further, we could see that Grid Warp works out of the box with pre-installed features in both 3D E4 and Nuke. The following method in Chapter 2 works differently. Let's find out how. Welcome to the second chapter of how to export lens distortion data to Nuke. Now it's time for LDPK, the Lens Distortion Plugin Kit. LDPK is a collection of files helping you to develop lens distortion plugins for 3D4 and compositing systems. Sounds complicated, but don't worry, there are pre-compiled plugin files as well for an easy usage. The kit can be found in section tech docs of 3dequalizer.com. Beside all files, installation instructions for Nuke and 3D4 are in the article as well. In this video, LDPK was already set up in both programs. Without wasting any time, let's get straight to exporting data. For this purpose, we use a shot with lens breathing effects. How to solve such a project is shown in detail in tutorial Adjust Curve Vertices. Here we start with a finished project. Ok, in menu 3D4, File, Export, Select Export Nuke LD 3D4 Lens Distortion Node. Please check to have version 1.5 or greater installed. If that's not the case, please download the latest Lens Distortion Plugin Kit from the Tech Talk section at 3dequalizer.com. In the appearing requester, select a path and file name. Due to a different handling of frame ranges of imported footage with the Nuke, start frame should be 1001. This issue is covered in detail in Chapter 1 Grid Warp, so feel free to watch it for a deeper explanation. Hit OK and move on to Nuke. Let's import our little node by right-clicking in the node graph. Then selecting File, 
insert card notes. Next, import footage head focus from folder tutorial 4. In case you don't have the files, they are available for free at 3dequalizer.com. Connect the read node with node LD3D4. Then node viewer to it as well. Oh boy, the image doesn't look right. It's a bit condensed. It seems we have a false pixel aspect value. In parameter format of the read node, we can find a nameless entry with the resolution of our footage. Let's edit this format. Here, change pixel aspect to 1.5. Please note, this is a quite untypical compression ratio resulting from the lens used to film this footage. Let's give this format a name. Okay, and we see everything's correct now. Click through the sequence and boom, we see that we see nothing. As we remember, LDPK start frame was set to frame 1001. So it's pretty clear why no undistortion happens at these frames. Simply set sequence head focus to the same start frame with parameter frame. Then set frame slider range from global to input. And now really, boom, we correctly undistorted footage for working in Nuke. There's a dotted line around the footage forming a bounding box. This is the so-called overscan, automatically created by LDPK. As mentioned in detail in Chapter 1, Grid Warp, overscan provides an area size greater than the footage to preserve all image transformations currently visible due to squeezing for undistortion. Although not visible, the image isn't cropped by Nuke and will be available in later steps, like redistorting. Back to our workflow. Let's add some great CGI to our footage. A checkerboard. Merge this board with the original sequence. We see we need some adjustments. First, since we are dealing with undistorted images, the board's resolution should match with an overscan format to make sure enough footage is available when transforming the image later by redistorting. For this purpose, we have to create a new one. Begin with a format name, then enter resolution 2200 by 1200, roughly 10% higher than the head focus resolution. This should be sufficient to cover transformations. Last, of course, pixel aspect is also 1.5. To see both footage and CG content, blending method or operation should be something like overlay. Okay, now we created a little conflict. Our original footage was undistorted, but still has its original resolution. All of its overscan is not visible. The checkerboard, on the other hand, was just defined with a greater resolution with all overscan visible. Merging two different sizes would crop the checkerboard to the head focus resolution and lose all of its overscan information. Not really what we want to achieve. To fix this, simply add a reformat node and set its format to head focus amorph. Next, our CGI shouldn't be rescaled to fit into the smaller format, so resize type has to be none. Last, to make sure all overscan information will be considered in later nodes, activate toggle button, preserve bounding box. Finally, two undistorted plates composited together. This helps us in the next step, redistorting the footage to gain back the original look of the lens for footage and CGI. Copy note, LD3D4 and insert it after merge. By default this node undistorts, so we have to change it. In the node's properties, set parameter direction to distort. Yeah, looks good. That's it with LDPK. We learned how to export distortion data from 3D4 and how to undistort and again redistort footage in Nuke. LDPK's strengths are definitely its easy usage and resolution independence. It is not dependent on a specific image resolution and can be used freely with any proxy footage.
The following method in last chapter 3 works differently. Let's find out how. Chapter 3 of this tutorial is all about STMAT. How to use 3D4 distortion data to create them and how to use SD maps for undistorting and also redistorting footage. To begin, what are SD maps? Basically, it is a subpixel accurate warp of an image built from a standard UV map, kind of like a lookup table of all pixels of an image. These pixels can be stored or positioned absolutely within such a map, since it has a unique color value and therefore a unique ID for each pixel. Now to apply distortion data on an image, each pixel of the original footage is transformed accordingly to the translation of the corresponding pixel in the UV map. Ok, enough theory. We will start with creating two ST maps, one each for undistorting and distorting footage. At first we need distortion data. Let's export our data from the project solved in tutorial, adjust curve vertices. Watch it here in our YouTube channel for a detailed look on how to solve a shot with lens breathing effects. Ok, in menu 3D4, File, Export, select Export New LD 3D4 Lens Distortion Node. Please check to have version 1.5 or greater installed. All the versions do not support SD maps. If that's not the case, Please download the latest Lens Distortion Plugin Kit from the Tech Talk section at 3dequalizer.com. In the appearing requester, select a path and file name. Due to a different handling of frame ranges of imported footage with the Nuke, start frame has to be 1001. This issue is covered in detail in Chapter 1 Grid Warp, so feel free to watch it for a deeper explanation. That's it with exporting! Move on to Nuke. Import footage head focus from folder tutorial 4 and connect the viewer to it. Great so far, but something's looking quite strange. The image seems to be a bit squashed. This might be due to a false pixel aspect value. In parameter format of the read mode, we can find an entry currently selected with the resolution of our footage. Let's edit this format. In the upcoming requester change pixel aspect to 1.5. Please note this is a quite untypical compression ratio resulting from the lens used to film this footage. Enter a name, then hit button OK. Looks much better. Next let's import the LDPK node by right clicking in the node graph, then file insert cop notes. Drag it onto the pipe between reader and viewer node. Having our footage connected to LDPK is mandatory to define the output resolution of our ST maps. Without original footage connected, the resolution information is missing leading to an unusable map. Click through the sequence and we see that we see nothing. As we remember, LDPK's start frame was set to frame 1001. So obviously there cannot be any undistortion at these frames. Simply set sequence head focus to the same start frame with parameter frame. Then set frame slider range from global to input. Now we can see we correctly undistorted footage for working in Nuke. To create an SD map, select node LDPK. Here we have to set parameter output mode to, you might guess it, SD map. It worked! We have a map with each pixel of the original image represented by a unique color value. At this point, thanks and a big hat tip to David Catterbowl and Ben Dixon from Rising Sun Pictures for their implementation of SD maps in LDPK. When clicking through the sequence, we notice the transformations due to the undistortion. To avoid any loss of information caused by transformations when exporting this SD map sequence, we should add overscan around the map. Topic overscan is discussed in detail in Chapter 1 Grid Warp. Feel free to watch it for a deeper explanation. To add such an area, insert a reformat node. 
Then define a new output format. Let's say with overscan we have defined a format of 2200 by 1200 pixels. Roughly 10% more in each direction of the original image. Pixel aspect, of course, must be 1.5 like head focus. Last, think of a good name and enter it. All content shouldn't be affected in any way, so parameter resize type is set to none. The dotted line represents the bounding box of the original image. See how it transforms through the sequence. To make sure this bounding box is considered during the export, activate toggle button Preserve Bounding Box. Last step is writing out this sequence. Let's create a write node and define path and file name. We recommend to use EXR as file type, since it allows float values for high precision and is an industry standard for its high compatibility. We notice Nuke detected that we set a file type in the requester and correctly activated specific parameters. Nice feature. Set color space to raw data. It is highly advisable to avoid any manipulation of data. Such a manipulation of color space might cause falsely distortion values. Data type should be set to 32-bit float for the same reasons. We're done, start the render. Quite easy, right? See you again after the rendering. Hello back. The undistorting ST map is finished. Let's quickly get the job done for distorting. What do we have to change? Two tiny parameters. In node LD3D4, set parameter direction to distort. Next, set a new path and file name for the redistortion ST map sequence. Then render again. Even easier, right? Everything's prepared, we can start our undistortion business. At first, duplicate our read node. Next is importing the undistort ST map from the file system. Here it is. So connect it to node viewer. When clicking through the sequence, we can clearly see all transformations and that nothing was clipped due to a sufficient overscan area. Good. Now, how do we apply this ST map on the image? Quite simple. There is a node called ST map. Please be aware that our head focus sequence does not have such overscan. Therefore, we have to reformat the ST map to match its resolution with the one of the footage. Create a reformat node. Then set it to format head focus. Again, please make sure this content won't be resized and preserve bounding box is activated to pass all information in the overscan area to later nodes. It is quite obvious which pipe belongs to which node, so connect both. Connect the viewer's pipe. Then click through the sequence to see that nothing happened. Ah, yes. We forgot to tell Nuke which channels of the ST map should be used for transformations. Within the node, set UV channels to RGB. That's it. We clearly see our footage is undistorted. To enhance the visibility of redistortion in the later step and to mimic a compositing workflow, let's add some CG content. A checkerboard should do the job. Merge it with the original sequence. We see we need some adjustments. First, the board's resolution should match with the overscan format to provide enough footage for distortion transformations. Second, like our ST map, reformat it to match with the head focus resolution. 
simply copy the existing node and insert it after the board. All parameters like format and bounding box are already set as we need them here as well. Last blending method or operation should be something like overlay so both images can be seen. Here we go, two undistorted plates composited together. Everything's ready for the next step, redistorting footage. Copy node SD map and insert it after merge. Pipe source is already connected correctly. Similar to the last step, we need an SD map. Now our previously generated distortion map will enter the stage. Since the workflow is pretty similar to undistortion, we use parts of the existing pipeline. Copy nodes read and reformat and paste it first anywhere in the node graph. Then connect pipe stmap to reformat. Of course, we have to change parameter file so it reads the distortion map. Great, we see original footage and CG content is distorted correctly. Good job! That's it with SD maps. We learned how to export distortion data from 3D4, how to create SD maps, one each for undistortion and redistortion, and how to apply these maps on footage in Nuke. We also saw SD maps' big advantage is its high speed compared to the other two methods. Finally, we made it! We used three different methods for working with 3D4 distortion data in Nuke. Grid warp, LDPK and SDMAPS. But like always in life, there seems to be no holy grail and each method has its advantages and disadvantages. You might see which method fits best in your workflow is depending, well, on your workflow. Let's sum up always. Grid Warp needs no installation of any plugin files, everything's on board by default. Further, it is as twice as fast as LDPK nodes. On the con side, there is a missing ability to work with proxy material, since Warping Grid is built on exact pixel values. The Lens Distortion plugin kit is very easy to use and is resolution independent. Once it was exported, its data can be used on all proxy shots. The LDPK con side lists mainly speed. Is it as half as fast as Grid Warp? Additionally, an installation of the kit is required. Last, ST Maps. A big pro is performance. It is roughly three times as fast as Grid Warp and seven times faster than LDPK. Further within its limits, it is scalable and therefore usable for proxy shots. A big con is a potential huge amount of additional files you have to manage. Alright, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial.